Good evening. Certainly thankful for all of you returning here this evening. We are continuing in a series that we started some time ago. It is called or titled the Why Series, and that is Why I Am a Member of the Church of Christ. I'm utilizing Leroy Brownlow's book titled such, and uh, we use various information or chapters that are contained in that book uh, to give us a springboard for the lessons that we've been using. And we've been studying, I think this may be the 22nd or 23rd lesson in a series going through that information. And so what I would like for us to do tonight is I would like for us to study, can a child of God so sin as to be eternally lost? There are those today, uh, many of our religious friends, that believe that once you obey the gospel, once you become a child of God and you are saved, that you can never, ever be lost. And no matter what you do, you're not going to have the ability to be lost. And then they would say that it could appear that maybe somebody was saved and they think that they are saved and the whole maybe their whole religious group or denomination says that person's saved and for a time everybody thinks they're saved but if they depart, then you know what they'll say? They won't say that person's lost. They'll say, well, that person was never a child of God, even though they've claimed for some time that they have been. But when that person departs, now the, 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 the slogan changes. Now we can't say, well, that person was never, ever a child of God. We're going to say they never actually were because they will not admit that a person can be eternally lost. So what I would like for us to do is I would like to, to dig into the Scriptures Let's look at the Bible. Let's see what the Bible has to say about this. Is it right that a person, once a person obeys the gospel, becomes a Christian? Can that person then be lost? Can they sin so that they will be lost in eternity? The truth is a child of God can fall and be lost. And we're going to look at several different passages tonight. And so I hope that you will uh, turn with me as we move through these passages. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. He says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Now, you'll notice just from that statement alone that the Bible does teach that you have a part to play in this. Those that often believe a doctrine maybe that would be titled once saved, always saved, or perseverance of the saints, or something similar to this, would say, really, you don't, because it's God completely. You have no part to play in being saved. It's all God. And because He is the one that saved you, you have no part in even being lost. And so you have no role to play to be saved or to be lost, because if God did it, then you have no role whatsoever. But what does the Bible actually say? Well, even in this text, it says that we are to give diligence. Now, he's talking to brethren to make your calling and election sure. So he's talking about those that are uh, have that election through Jesus Christ, that calling, and he says that then they have to give and put forth an effort. And actually, if you look at the word diligence, it means you have to put forward every effort. So he's saying you've got to put forward every effort to make sure your election or your calling, as the Bible says. And then you notice the qualifier that's there, and it's conditional. It says if. And that word alone is a conditional statement. If ye do these things, ye shall never fall. And so there's the qualifier. If, and again, there is a part in which you must do. There's, he's talking to the individual Christian saying that, you have to continue in these things, and you have to do these things. And if you do, that is what has been discussed here in the context, then you're not going to be lost. So on one side, this verse provides great assurance, blessed assurance, to the faithful child of God who is doing exactly what's talked about in this passage because we know that we have that salvation. However, for the one that is a child of God, but that chooses not to do what is described in this passage, then they will be lost. Now, what in the world is it that we are to do? Because it does clearly say, if you do 
these things. What is it that we have to do? Some people say, well, there's nothing you can do to be saved or lost. Well, no, that's not what the text says. It does say that there is something that we do to make sure that our calling and election is sure. What? What is that? Let's look at the text. Go back and look at the verses that precede that verse, and you'll see the context of what he has been discussing. He talks about those things that we are to add. We call those the Christian virtues of which we are to add to our lives. And he says, besides this, giving all diligence, again, there's that diligence, that effort that we are to put forward. He says, you are to add to your faith, what? Virtue. And then virtue, knowledge. Knowledge, temperance. Temperance, patience. Patience, godliness. And godliness, brotherly kindness. And brotherly kindness, charity, or agape love as we would know it. Notice in verse 8, he says, For if these things be in you and abound, they make that you shall be neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, again, there's that conditional statement that's been placed here. He says, if this is what you do, then you're not going to be considered barren. If you do these things, then number one, you're not going to fall. Because if you're doing that and you're a Christian, he's talking to those that are brethren. He's talking to those that are Christians because they have faith to add stuff to. They've got the faith. So he's talking to those that are already saved. And he says to them, if you as a Christian continue in these things and add these things to your life and live in those then you're not going to be considered barren you're not going to be considered unfruitful notice in verse 9 he says but he that lacketh these things now and there's the contrast those that lack these things the bible says that person is blind cannot see afar off and have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins now some people would say it's not possible for a person who is in Christ to be lost. But notice this passage is specifically talking to Christians, and he's addressing those that clearly have had their past sins purged, but had forgotten it. You see, because why? Well, they're not doing these things. If they were doing those things, then the Bible says they're not going to fall. Why? They would be considered the individuals that are walking in the light, the blood of Christ continually cleansing them. That's what that's describing, those individuals that are doing. But it does show in this context that those that are Christians who have had their sins purged in the past, still, if they do not follow the right path, can be considered barren, unfruitful, and will be lost. The Bible describes what happens to individuals that are barren and unfruitful. It doesn't describe them going to heaven. Matter of fact, it describes the opposite of that. It describes in several passages that we're going to consider tonight to show you that those that are barren, those that are unfruitful, will be purged, cast into the fire. That's what the Bible says. So clearly, even just from one passage, and really it only takes one to show that it is possible for someone who is a Christian, has had their sins purged, then not to live a faithful life in Jesus Christ and so be judged lost eternally. You see, he says, if one do these things, he will not fall or fail. But notice, if you don't do those things, the opposite end of that spectrum, then what does that mean? Well, the opposite is true. That person will fall. And notice in, in, it describes in New King James and the, the NLT, it says, giving all diligence or make every effort. And that's what's described of us in the Christian life. So when we obey the gospel, then we are to continue to live for Christ. And we have to put forth that effort, make every effort to continue to add those Christian virtues in our life. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, another passage under consideration as we ask the question, is it possible for a child of God to so sin and eternally be lost? 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, he says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Why in the world would this statement or this command be given if it's not possible to fall? Why would the author, why would the apostle Paul write to the church at Corinth and tell them that they need to be real careful 
Why? Lest they what? Fall. Well, if you can't fall, why would he say that? Well, it's clear just from that statement alone, it is possible then to fall. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. Paul, the apostle, believed it was possible to fall. As a matter of fact, he says, I've got to look at my own life. I've got to make sure that I'm living as I should be living so that I myself am not a castaway. Notice the passage, 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He would be lost. And so he wants to make sure, and that's why he works so diligently to make sure that he is living the life that he should be living so that in the end, in the judgment day, that he is found faithful. Now, a child of God can quit believing. Look at Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. The warning that is given in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12 is this. He says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be any in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And so a child of God can quit believing. And when that person does, they begin falling. Is it possible to fall from grace? Uh, well, there's a lot of religious people today that say it's not possible to fall from grace. But notice in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4, now, in the context of the book of Galatians, those people had obeyed the gospel, they were Christians, and yet some of them came out of Judaism. And they wanted to bring a part of that over into Christianity, and so they were trying to go back and trying to bind and to bring into Christianity that which did not belong from Judaism. And he's speaking to those individuals that are trying to go back and do that. These are Christians. He says, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. They're Christians. They've obeyed the gospel. But yet they're trying to go back and, and receive their justification by requirements of the Old Testament law. And that's what they were doing. One of those was circumcision. That was just one part of it. And yet they were saying, well, you have to be circumcised to be justified before God. But yet these still are individuals. Don't forget, they're Christians. And he's saying, if you do that as a Christian, you are fallen from grace. So it shows clearly that it is possible for someone who is in Christ, who is a Christian, to then fall from grace. A Christian, of course, can fall from grace because man is saved by grace, according to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. And then what we read in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4, that a Christian may fall from that grace, therefore a Christian may be lost. Now look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. In this passage, it shows us a Christian can be lost. Now, in the context, as he's dealing with false teachers, it doesn't matter if you're a teacher or if you're not a teacher. We're talking about an individual who's a Christian. And as he talks about those individuals and he speaks about what they had done in the broader context of the whole chapter, whether or not I'm a teacher or a preacher, it just simply shows that a Christian can fall. Now, if a teacher can be a Christian, and then fall, can everybody else? The answer is yes, it is. And so that's why most of the time you hear us go into the passages such as this one, and we would apply it to everybody because, well, if it applies to a teacher, even though that person has become a Christian and turned away, it would apply to anybody. So we look at the text here. He says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that, that's a description of an individual who's obeyed the gospel. They've escaped. And yet now they're again entangled therein and then overcome. So you have somebody that's obeyed the gospel. They've escaped. They come back and then they're again entangled in sin and then again overcome. And, and, and he's talking about somebody that's not turning back here. Uh, according to this context, it's not going to be good for them. Matter of fact, he says the latter end is worse off than the beginning. It's going to be even worse off for those individuals. It would have been better off if they had not even known the way of righteousness than to have known it and to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. And he gives a couple of illustrations, a couple of true proverbs 
that are gross. The dog going back, uh, you know, <laughs> it's gross. And then the, the sow that goes back and wallers in the mire after being washed. And that's the vivid imagery of what it's like to know, uh, to, to be in sin and to be that, 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 that sow that's covered and to be cleansed, to become clean by the blood of the Lamb and to receive the gospel and to be right with God and then to look back at that mud puddle and say, I want to go back and get in it and then do it. It's just like a dog that eats, oh, it was good the first time, I'm going to yak it up, and then I think I'm going to have seconds. That's nasty. But that's the description of a person who obeys the gospel, becomes a Christian, is cleansed and purged, and has left that, and then turns right back and goes right back into sin and turns away from the Christ that saves them. And that is the picture that is given here. Now, it says that they escaped, they were entangled again and overcome, the end is worse than the start. Why is the last state worse than the first? If a, this person is going to go to heaven, could the last state be worse than the first? And you have to think about that. Because individuals that believe that once you have come in contact, you've been purged, you've been cleansed, you've obeyed the gospel, and you've come in and you've accessed that grace, you can never lose that. How can this statement even be true? You see, there's a contradiction by what people believe today and what the Bible actually does teach. Several examples from parables believe clearly teach it. You, we all are familiar with the parable of the, the soils or the, the parable of the sower. We know it very well. The seed, it's the Word of God. You've got the sower that's going out and spreading seed. That's the teacher, the preacher. Then you've got the soil. That's the, the mind or the heart of the individual that's receiving the teaching. And so you've got different soils. You've got a wayside. Those individuals didn't become Christians. Matter of fact, in Luke chapter 8 and verse 12, here it speaks of that wayside. It says, Then cometh the devil. He taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. These individuals, they didn't become Christians. Then you go to another type of soil. You've got stony soil. And here in the stony soil, these are individuals that accepted the word, but then what? They withered due to tribulation, persecution, temptation. Both Matthew and Luke's account bear this out. You notice there as it references this in those texts that are on the screen. They hear, they receive the word with joy. They have no root. After a while, believe, and in a time of temptation, then fall away. Wait a minute. This is individuals. That's exactly right. They receive, but the Bible says they fall away. That's exactly right. So these individuals that are a part of the stony ground, they became Christians. But the Bible says also they failed to produce fruit. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while, and when tribulation and persecution ariseth because of the word, and by and by he is offended. These individuals produce no fruit. And because of this, according to Matthew chapter 7, verse 19, very or every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Then there's the thorny soil. These are individuals that became Christians, but the Bible says, according to Matthew's account, the care of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. So here you have somebody who's a Christian. But then you've got Satan at work in their lives and lures them away from staying faithful to God and they become unfruitful. Luke's account says when they have heard, they go forth and are choked with the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. What happens again to those that have no fruit? Well, we read at the very outset of this lesson from Peter's account and now we come here and look at this passage again. You've got those that are Christians, accepted the word, then later fell. Matthew 13, 22 says that he becometh unfruitful. Unfruitful. And what does the Bible say about those that are unfruitful? Those that bringeth forth no good fruit, they're hewn down, they're cast into fire. So we're talking about individuals that have received the word, that have obeyed the gospel, they're Christians because they're not fruitful. Then, can you tell me, that they're going to go to heaven? When the Bible describes those that are unfruitful, 
in a very different light. It says, matter of fact, they're going to be hewn down and cast into the fire. That doesn't sound like heaven to me. And so the Bible makes it very clear, even from these simple parables that most of us are very, very familiar with, this shows us that, yeah, there's a couple of different types of soil. We talk about that all the time. But when you actually look at it, it shows us it's possible for someone to obey the gospel, become a Christian, and still not do the will of the Father in their lives. Continue to walk in what the Bible calls the light, 1 John chapter 1. you got the parable of the vine and the branches in John chapter 15. And so you've got a branch that was once in the vine, a branch that was connected, a branch that is a Christian, but then can be burned. Most of the time when we go to this text, we're not necessarily focusing on this aspect of it, but it is there if you actually look in John chapter 15. Notice verse 2. He says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So the one that's unfruitful, barren, what's he going to do with it? He's going to take it away. Well, let's hear the description of what that means. In verse 6, he says, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them in the fire, and they are burned. Now, in this passage, when we talk about the vine, that's Christ, the branches are not individual denominations. These are individual Christians. Notice, he says, if a man abide in me. We're not talking about religious groups, no. And actually, in the context, we're talking about those individual Christians that are plugged into Christ. And he says, they're going to be able to remain if they live in me, if they abide in me. And those that don't, they're going to be pruned, purged, and burnt. Well, some say if one falls away, they were never actually in Christ. The man who was in Christ but did not abide in Christ was cast out. In this passage, the one that was in Christ, because how could he be a part of the vine? How could he be a branch in the vine? If he wasn't a Christian, in order to be a branch that's a part of the vine and attached to Christ, you had to be a Christian first. There there, there isn't anybody that's attached to the vine that's not a Christian. So a Christian is the one that is a part of that vine. But wait a minute. That same one who did not live there and stay there and was unfruitful, that one was cast out, cast into the fire. And so a lost branch at one point in time was a branch that was in Christ and that was a part of that vine. So this passage again shows us the same thing. What about the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30? You've got in this context, those that are considered the servants of the Lord. Now, I don't know if anybody would say, well, that if you're referencing somebody that's a servant of the Lord, well, that person's not really in Christ. That person's not a Christian. If we're talking about a servant of the Lord, generally that's what we're talking about, especially in the context of the New Testament. And here you've got individuals. There were... All of those that are considered the servants of the Lord, but two were faithful, one was not. One of them is considered unprofitable and wicked and slothful. And so one of those Lord's servants was to be cast into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. But yet, in this parable, all of them are considered the Lord's servants. One of them was unprofitable and was punished. So again, it gives us another illustration from the biblical text. And it is possible for a person, a child of God, to so sin as to be eternally lost. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 41 and 42, he says, The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, I don't think that any of us would say, well, this passage is talking about heaven. None of us would say that. Furnace of fire, weeping, and that's not heaven. We all know what that's talking about. Okay. Well, well then he, he talks about the fact that he's going to gather out of his kingdom. How's that possible? That means there are some that are in the kingdom, but that are not continuing to abide in Jesus Christ. 
They're not continuing to abide in that branch, and they're going to be separated and ultimately cast in the fire. Exactly what we just read in John and many other passages of which we've just examined, the same thing is illustrated here. So we can't say, well, they were never in the kingdom. That's not what the passage says. Well, it says he's gathering them out of the kingdom. They had to be in the kingdom to be gathered out of the kingdom, right? Well, yes, they do. Revelation chapter 3, he's speaking to the church of Laodicea. He says, so then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, that none of us would go to this passage and say, now, this is a good thing. <laughs> right? I've never heard a sermon where the preacher was standing up and talking about Laodicea and how we all need to be like Laodicea. Have you ever heard that one? That'd be a new one. Never heard that one. We all want to be spewed out of Christ's mouth. No, never heard that. Why? Because it's not a good thing. It's a bad thing. And he's talking to the church, though. Don't forget that. He's talking to those that are Christians. And he's telling them, and, and over and over, you see, in, in, as he's addressing the seven churches of Asia, many of those congregations received rebuke. He recognizes that those individuals are Christians. They are a part of the church. But many of them, if they did not repent, were going to be chastised. So you can see over and over in this text the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3 says that the Spirit makes it plain, makes it clear, so that no one can mistake it. And that's what it means when it says the Spirit speaketh expressly. I mean, it just as plain as can be. As plain as the nose on your face. You ever heard anybody say that? That's what this passage is referencing. When the Spirit says it, it's clear. Crystal clear. What is crystal clear? That on down the road, in latter times, some shall depart from the faith. How can you depart from the faith if you're not in the faith? You see, they were in the faith, but they're departing from the faith. And how are they going to do that? Well, they're going to give heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meat which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Again, how can you depart from something you never had? You can't. And so he's describing here, and he says, the Spirit has made this really clear that it's coming, it's going to come in the near future, in the latter times. This is what's happening. This is what's going to happen. There are going to be those that are in the faith, and they're going to depart from the faith. I'm not quite sure how anybody could say, well, we'll have to concede they were in the faith. That means that they had the grace of God and that they were saved. But those are, there's individuals that say, well, if, if that's the case, then once you're there, you're always saved. There's nothing that you can do to be lost. So they would have to concede that somebody could follow the doctrines of devils and still be in heaven. But the Bible just doesn't teach that. It just doesn't. So when we examine the text, the Bible makes it clear. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 12, he says, Having damnation or condemnation, because they have cast off their first faith. What does that mean? It means that when they received the faith, that was their first faith. And you know what? They were in the faith when they, they were there, but they've cast it off. They put it aside. And what does the Bible talk? How does the Bible describe that? If you have the faith, once and for all delivered to the saints, and then you cast aside your first faith, what does the Bible say about that? You depart from it. There's condemnation. Having damnation, condemnation. Why? Because what they have done is they have cast aside their first faith. The Bible would consider that their first love as well from the book of Revelation. So when you go to Galatians chapter 6, 7 through 9, I think it shows clearly that it is possible for a Christian to so choose to live in such a way that they would separate themselves from God and to be lost. He says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that 
shall he also reap. I, I know we're real familiar with that, but if we considered exactly what he's saying, those that sow to the flesh, they of the flesh will reap corruption. Now, he's writing to the Christians. He's writing to the church of Galatia, the churches of Galatia. And he's telling them that if they live after the flesh, to fulfill the desires of the flesh and of the mind, the Bible would say, if they live after the works of the flesh, what is it that they're going to get? Corruption. It doesn't say if you sow to the flesh, you'll get heaven anyway. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap everlasting life. The Bible just doesn't teach the principle that's, that often denominations are teaching. What it says is, as a Christian, if you choose to live a sinful life, you're going to have corruption. You're not going to get the eternal life. As a Christian, you need to be sowing to the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. Notice as he says, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life ever." lasting then he tells us not to be weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not a christian may sow to the flesh and what are they going to harvest corruption and that is not eternal life with god in heaven and so only an individual who is a christian who sows to the spirit will harvest eternal life in james chapter 2 He's writing to those that are Christians. How do you know that? In James chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with the respect of persons. So he's speaking to Christians. Because he's talking, talking about those that have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 5. As he's talking, he's writing, he's addressing those that are Christians, that have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says, brethren, if any of you, who? Those that have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, if any of you do err from the truth, and one, turn him back, convert him, let him know that he which converteth or turns back a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. He's talking about those that are Christians. Someone that has obeyed, someone that has the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he's speaking to Christians and telling them, if any one of you turns away from truth, and somebody comes after you and brings you back, they've saved your soul, you, a Christian, who's turned from truth, they've saved your soul from death so the bible makes it clear it is possible we can sin against the brethren and cause them to perish according to first corinthians chapter 8 and verse 11 it's possible for a child of god to sin and so sin to be lost in eternity he talks about the fact that that through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish from whom christ died you know there's the first death and the, there's the second death and the bible you know, tells us it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that cometh the judgment. That once is going to be when we have physical death. It'll be either that or the Lord will return first. But we assume that we're going to face physical death. That's the first death. What's the second death? That the Bible talks about in Revelation chapter 20. The second death. Well, that's, uh, that's the lake of fire that's talked about. Fire and brimstone and destruction. That's the spiritual death, spiritual separation. That's being separated from God for all eternity. And so it talks about that. So he says, through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish. Now, wait a minute. What kind of perishing are we talking about here? So does it mean that because I'm, I'm knowledgeable and I have a, an understanding of a thing, whether it's to sacrifice, eat meat, sacrifice to idols, or whatever it is in context, it might be offensive to some. And I have a knowledge of that thing, and, but because of my knowledge, I call somebody who is weak in the faith to perish. Does it mean literally, because of my knowledge, they're going to die physically? We've got to get the casket and bury them. Nobody would think that. It's not because of my knowledge that we're going to have to bury them. We're going to have to have a funeral because now they're dead. 
we understand that it talks about when it's talking about them perishing, we're talking about spiritual separation. They're what? Lost. That means that Here we have a brother, and because they're weak and because of our actions of someone that's stronger, it could cause them to turn away from Christ and be lost for eternity. That's exactly what is being described here. In Acts chapter 5, we know old Ananias and Sapphira. And they decided they were going to put a hoax on God and the apostles, right? And they sold their land, but then when they brought the price of that and laid it at the apostles' feet, they were dishonest because they represented that they had sold this land and brought all of it, everything, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But guess what? They were dishonest. They they were deceitful. They lied, the Bible says, to the Holy Ghost. Let me ask you a question. Were Ananias and Sapphira Christians? They were. They were. They were New Testament Christians. But they came and deceived and lied to God. They lied to the Holy Ghost according to Acts chapter 5 and they died lost. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8 talks about those. Specifically mentions liars. They have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. So the question that is asked and we're looking for biblical evidence and we've examined a lot of passages. But we do that in, in hopes that it will clear up any confusion that somebody might have. Because the Bible does make it clear. It tells us that we need to be diligent to give every effort to make our calling and our election sure. That we are continuing in those things, adding the things that are described in Second Peter chapter 1, those virtues. We need to make sure that we are walking in the light as He is in the light so that we have fellowship one with the other so the blood of Jesus Christ can continually cleanse us of our sins as we confess those wrongs. 1 John chapter 1, 6 through 10. The question is, where do you stand with God as we close out our lesson? Now we have to shine the light back upon yourself. You have to say, okay, now how does this apply to me? Well, maybe you've already obeyed the gospel. You already believe that Jesus is the Christ. You've confessed that He is the Savior of the world. You've, you've turned away from your past sins. You confess his, your belief that He was the Savior before men. You were baptized. Your sins were washed away. You rose to walk in a new life. You started living that way, but now you've turned away. And maybe you're just not walking in the light at all. And you need to come home. You can do that. If you don't, then hopefully this lesson will open your eyes to the reality of the fact that if you choose to turn away from God and not truly live for Him as a fruitful child of His, then judgment will be yours. You will stand before God and give an account of how you've lived with a new life that God has granted you. Are you a child of God? If not, why not tonight? have your past sins forgiven, and have a hope of eternal life in heaven. If you are a child of God, but you have not been living faithfully, you need to be restored. We'll pray with you and for you. We can assist you in any way once you come. Together we sing the song of invitation.